All right, thank you everybody for joining us. This is Daniel Ransom, uh, CCA's Instructional Services Librarian. Um, this is our mural community of practice session where you'll get a chance to see some of the ways in which your own colleagues have been using mural uh, to support their courses. And I think all of them have kind of different interesting takes on, on how they've used this uh, particular software. Um, I am CCA's point of contact around Mural. Um, so if you were to write to help desk with questions around use of Mural or um, either from the kind of technical or creative side, uh, I'm probably the person who's gonna be responding to you, but I am also joined today um, by Sasha Rappaport, a transformation manager at Mural. Uh, he is our liaison in connection within the Mural uh, organization. So. Um, he's here, and if you've got kind of more technical questions, if things come up during the session, he might have an opportunity to respond to you over chat or, or help you out with any questions that you've got. So feel free to use the chat uh, to chime in and, and ask any questions you've got. Right now, you can see a mural board uh, that's designed around facilitating this session. Um, and at the end of the session, you'll be given a link to it. And within it, you will find links to some of the different boards that your colleagues have put together. So you'll have a chance to actually really look at them up close after they've explained how they use them. Um, so with that, uh, I am going to uh, have Helen, Helen Maria Nugent uh, step up, our Dean of Design and share how she's been using, uh, how she's been using Mural this last year. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm going to do a big shout out to Kate Rutter because she really helped me figure out some of these things I'm going to show you. So she um, is very good at, at this software. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Indeed. Great. Wonderful. So I just wanted to start here um, because one of the things that Kate talked to me about was how to one way to potentially structure how to use it for your class. And if you look on the left hand side over here where it says SPEC, my class is called Design Speculation. Um, and one of the really key things that I found really useful was to create this student works folder. And in the folder, I actually made a page for every single student in the class, pre-made it, um, and then asked them to work in those pages. And what was really key about this is that I could see all of the pages and all the other students could see all the pages. So for me, it was a little bit like being in class together, um, even though we were virtual. Um, so. So what I'm going to share with you and what you're going to be able to take a look at later, so sorry I'm scrolled all the way out right now, but just a quick piece of context. So this is an MFA design graduate seminar. So students in the MFA design program and the DNBA program take this class. It's focused on teaching them research skills, uh, how to expand the ways in which they think about how to do research and support other projects. My particular class is in support of speculative design projects, so projects based in the future that are uh, take a critical stance on how technologies or events or activities might uh, change in the future. So what you're seeing right here is you're seeing this top section are these templates that I've created for ways in which I want them to, uh, to do research. So new frameworks and new tools that can help them do research in different ways than what they maybe normally do. And then down below, this is an example that we actually do in class. So we do it together, helps them to understand how to use Mural, and it also means that they can understand kind of where we're going with the template. And um, so I'm just going to zoom in. And I'm just going to give a really high level overview because I think you can go look later. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions. And I wrote a bunch of notes. So the most important thing that I'm doing in this class is I'm trying to get them initially to think in a more divergent way about their research. Uh, students want to think about the future and then come up with a project. And my job in this class is to stop them from doing that right away and to have them learn about what's happening in the world. So I use a futures framework in this first part. And what you see here is you, are, is you see the framework I'm asking them to use. So I put some information about the different 
uh, language that I'm using, but it's really minimal. So I try to put just a reminder of what these things mean and how the thing is going to be used into the mural. I actually use Moodle for all of my course materials and, um, you know, the longer project assignments and things like that. But once you see Jeanette's, you'll see that you can actually put them all in here. And so I'm thinking I'm going to do that. I'm going to steal Jeanette's idea and do that. So anyway, um, what you see here is you see the ways in which I'm having students understand a topic, the domain, uh, what I call these drivers of change, these large thematic uh, uh, ways of thinking about how change happens in the world. In this case, I'm teaching them the STEEP uh, framework, which is to look at social change, technological change, environmental change, economic change, and political change. So they have to fill these out. So they go into there, they, they make a copy of this. Oh, I forgot to say that. So I, I give them access to this. They make a copy of the framework, they put it into their mural page, and then they use it. So if they mess up or they, you know, if they do something wrong with the, with the framework, they can come back and get another copy and use it. It also means that they can keep it forever, you know, so they can use these various frameworks. So basically, what else do I want to say? I mean, I think the, the most useful thing about this for me, I don't really want to go into all the different frameworks, but we look for research. We find drivers of change. I ask them then to find what we call in futures terms, signals of change, very specific examples of things that are happening in the world that they can find typically on the internet. So it could be a news story, could be a blog page, could be a new product announcement, but it has to be something that's actually happening in the world. And the wonderful thing about Mural is they can link the research right here. So I no longer have to say, where's that website where you find that article? They can just link the article right here and they can go back and find that piece of research. It's really a super useful way because students are not always organized in how they research. Um, and then as you go through here, you'll see that we move into ways to really refine this research, to ask questions about what it might mean for their subject area. And I prepare these, frameworks to help them ask the right questions at the right time in their research. Now, obviously students can mix these up. So they go back and forth. They might go back a step and then go forward step. That's totally fantastic when they do that. But it also means that I can come in to their individual pages and see where they're not filling things out or they've missed something or it does, it's not clear but it's really a fantastic way for me to get in the student's mind because all of the research is here on uh, on this mural page so i have three different stages this is stage one it's research it's building ideas of the future uh, speculations it's creating scenarios about those speculations who's doing what why are they doing it what are their values what technology they're using where are they and then at the end of stage one, they build these concepts. Basically, here's just a couple of examples. And then stage two is about world building. They build a world around this concept. And then stage three, they make it what we call a designed fiction. So they actually fictionalize the future by making something that could exist in this particular future. So if you look, once you can go back in here, you can see below, I know it's a bit zoomy when you're going in and out, but you can see, I always choose the future of food as my example for the entire class, because I feel like every single student has an opinion on the future of food and they can participate in this kind of trial example. And I ask them each to work in teams to build out these pieces of research. And again, it's a way for them to practice learning how other students do research. And then we go through the entire process together so they understand where they're trying to get to. And in this case, uh, the example that the students came up with was um, they read a news article that said that cultured meat will replicate the taste and consistency of traditional meat, which was already done, actually. And their question was, why would I care? Like, what happens then? And it was, what if it becomes impossible to distinguish cultured meat from real meat? What are the consequences of that future? And then they again use this steep uh, structure to ask questions about how does society change? How might technology change? How might the economics of food change if this was the future? So it's a very fun exercise to do. We go through the whole thing. Um, and I think that's it. So the pros for me of using the software is I can see all the students research all at once. I can dig in. Uh, they can they can ping me and tell me to go look at an article, to go look at something. I can do it asynchronously. 
Um, and I think it's a way where students, if I go back, you can, because they can look at all the rest of the students boards in the student workspace, they can see that everyone's thinking differently and that even though we're using templates, a template doesn't mean that you have to think the same way. It's a way to structure your thinking to allow you to see where you are not being very expansive or you're being too expansive, for instance. So these pages, as you can see, really do not look much like each other at all. That's it. Okay, thank you. That was great. Um, I, I do wanna mention uh, if we have some amongst our participants or our, our our viewers here today, people who are less experienced in mural, and you're like, wait, how would I do any of that? Um, uh, what we're focusing on today are interesting ways in which some of our faculty have implemented use of mural. If you need something that's a little more introductory, how do I get started using mural? Um, we recorded, Sasha and I uh, co-hosted a session last week on a kind of introduction to mural uh, session that was recorded, and you can find it in the faculty video recordings folder in Panopto or on the mural support page in the teaching lab, uh, the video is embedded there. So you can just watch that, get up to speed on, on the basics, and then think about how you can creatively implement mural uh, like Helen Maria did. Um, so now we're going to, to shift over to Jeanette Kim, um, the uh, uh, assistant professor in uh, architecture and director of Urban Works. Um, I hope I said all of that right. <laughs> um, and. Uh, uh, Jeanette will, will show how she used Mural. Take it away. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Hope, hope your week is going well. <laughs> um, I'm going to share with you um, some Mural pages for a studio that I taught last spring with Lisa Finley and Chris Folliers. And the studio was um, an undergraduate core curriculum studio, um, uh, Studio 4 in the Bjark program. Um, that designed housing um, and the studio is called Home Economics. Um, so um, I'll give you an overview of how I set everything up. Um, this page right here is just one mural, one mural board that acts as a kind of mission control for the entire studio. And what I loved about that was that, you know, it's, it's really easy for students to get like lost in all the material that we all give them and that they're all producing. And this gave them an overview that helped them kind of zoom around to different um, kinds of media. So what, what you're seeing here is um, at the very top, the syllabus um, in the very in the middle section references to studio policies and formats and media and things like that. And then um, over on the right hand side, we have a bit more like housekeeping kinds of things where we um, kept links to all of the zoom recordings for both crits and reviews. Um, and then we had a whole section here for um, lectures that we were recording and sharing with the students, um, but also just like Pinterest boards or other resources that um, we hoped the students would look at. And then the section down here was the most active and this one um, defined whatever our particular brief was for that part of the semester. So if, if this is 3.2, this is sort of now at the very tail end of the semester. Um, so if that's the overview, um, generally anything you're seeing on the board directly is just like our handout or um, in this case, a few images that we especially wanted the students to look at. Um, but other than that, all of our buttons and links were generally made through these little circular but, um, graphics. Um, which was easy for us because like if you start loading in a PDF and some other link and some other thing it starts to get visually quite noisy. Um, so this allowed the students to understand what was kind of core and then what was a link out to something else. Um, so just to give you like a bit more of an example of that, um, like even just in our syllabus, you know, there were links to like the videos that we made to introduce them to everything. Um, we also saved um, the pinup boards and all of the, the kind of process materials that the students did along the way made them much smaller so they're not too overwhelming but if someone wanted to go back to project one and see what they had done with a particular drawing they knew where to go find it um, and you know here we'd have like you know references for site information or um, rhino files for templates or things like that so um yeah so i think that gives you the general idea here um we also, we originally had a section here that was for studio communication. 
Um, and we show the students how to basically, you know, add a comment to this. And then um, hopefully over here, you can see that like I could write in, you know, I could write in like at myself and then I could ask myself a question and then it would automatically get sent to me in an email. Um, and similarly, if they were working in a group project or something like that, they could um, use that to communicate there. And we kind of set up a system where everyone had to turn their notifications on and we would try to use that platform. In the end, we, we used it like twice and it was great, <laughs> but we just didn't need it anymore because we actually had a lot of contact hours. But for some classes that might not have a lot of synchronous time, that might be one way to do it. Because I, I did like the way it worked. Um, it, going into this section in a little bit more detail, um, what we had on the left-hand side were links to all of the pinup boards for both process and presentation work. And then here we basically just had each step of the handout um, described here. And then I took out the links here to preserve sort of um, and um, you know privacy of the students. Um, but I could click on this link and then it would basically open up like a Word doc um, that explained what's happening on Monday, what's happening on Tuesday, et cetera. So they would always, always go there. And then we didn't do this throughout the semester, but we started doing this at the end where if there were totally key drawing ideas that we wanted the students to be thinking about with each part of the assignment, we'd start dropping them down below. Um, and then similar, as I said before, like we'd have links to Pinterest boards or a tutorial lecture that we made or something like that. So they really knew what to, what to connect and what to prioritize at certain moments. Um, so, okay, so that's the overview. Um, I thought I would also give, um, give you a little bit of a sense of some of the things that this is linking to. Um, so for example, um, and th these boards are not um, available in the, the links that Daniel will hand out, but I'll at least give you a sense of a preview right now. Um, so these boards were basically our conversation boards. So anytime we had just a group gathering and we wanted to talk about, you know, process issues or run, run a workshop about how to make models or something like that, um, we just set up these sort of discussion questions for the readings or um, um, like, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the word, but like agreements, studio agreements among the students and things like that. Um, Similarly, I know this looks chaotic, but it um, uh, I think worked quite well for us. So if you went back here and you linked into one of the um, pinup boards for the student work, you would get to something like this. And in advance, I would set up like this gray box and then I would set up uh, little white squares or rectangles for any of the deliverables that the students had. So if we were asking them to make like an 11 by 17 drawing, I'd put in an 11 by 17 white box and I'd write, you know, research drawing here. And at first I thought it would be a bit prescriptive, but the students loved it because they always knew what was being asked of them every week. They knew exactly sort of like how to locate the work. And then it just, it kind of allowed us to then build on it. So um, the placeholders were very useful for us. Um, another thing you'll see here is that we basically had, you know, one sort of pinup area for each student. Um, and then we, that allowed us to have overlaps where one student who's working on elder care could look across and see what another student was doing about elder care. So there was like a lateral kind of um, uh, cross-reference across the students. Um, and then um, we, from left to right, we then moved um, through each sequence of a student's work. So this might be like Monday and this is Thursday and this is Monday and so on, um, which I, absolutely loved because you could ask a student to basically grab Monday's work, copy it into Wednesday, draw on top of it, and then kind of alter it as they go. Um, and I just thought I'd show this example, which I really like, which is like here on Monday, the student did this work and he like forgot about something he did on Thursday. And I was like, look at this model. It's awesome. <laughs> and so like, literally you can just like cross that information back and forth, you know, and then as I'm sure you're all doing, like we were just drawing on top of everything. And then um, I think this example shows also well how like the students could comment on each other's work and kind of, you know, leave a section for that kind of exchange. And then we'd overlap. I loved this kind of thing where you could just like link 
like directly to some re reference exactly as Helen Maria said. Um, so anyway, it was just really fun. Like I, I love it so much. I would, I would do this, um, you know, even as we go back to hybrid learning, um, I think it really helps uh, the students. Like, I think in this case, prioritize and link kind of relate all this information that's coming through to them. Um, it helped them understand how they how their work related to each other's and it helped the sequence enormously. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, all right. Um, and uh, I'm sure people have questions for, for Jeanette and Helen Maria. We will uh, reserve some time for Q&A at the end, but up next, we have Matthew Boyko from uh, an assistant professor in the MFA design program. Um, and he's going to go ahead and share how he used the boards. Okay, hi. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to share. I'm going to share a Google Slides doc and kind of walk through some things to contextualize. And then um, I also have some video captures of how the board appears kind of live in use. I took a video of last spring of people using it. And so you can kind of see the the interaction that occurs, it's sped up so you can kind of see it. But first I want to say uh, the prior two people are um, like power users compared to me. I'm like a super basic um, mural user. So um, you'll see kind of a, a really simple way from my examples on how to use it. So let me share my screen here. Okay, uh, can you see? Hold on one second. Let me reset that. I'm not getting the full screen. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, so I'm a, a assistant professor in MFA design. This is my seventh year here. Um, just to contextualize, so I teach in uh, year zero. It's a three-year program, and so the studio course that I teach is for people that some of them have like zero experience in art and design. So um, it's a, sometimes it's a little bit challenging to get everyone ramped up into kind of the language that we're using and kind of the process that we're using. So I mainly use Mural and in combination with Zoom as a way in, in this instance, instances that I'm gonna show you is during a studio critique. And this is kind of the makeup of a class, typical makeup. So, you know, we've got, five different countries represented and lots of different disciplines. And so everyone, you know, is, is using this first year to kind of get on the same page, so to speak. This is kind of typical for the work that comes out. And this is kind of typical for the work that we, we, we critique. Sometimes it's sketches, sometimes it's um, these like rudimentary models and other times it's uh, digital files. And this is the kind of work that we're discussing and using mural to discuss. So my challenge uh, for this coming year is to augment the physical. And because we're moving from uh, completely virtual to hybrid for studio classes, I'm trying to figure out how to integrate mural and still retain some of the physical. And um, I know that a lot of, maybe some of you out there are still gonna be all virtual. So, um, you know, maybe some of the examples that I'm using apply more to what you're doing because I was completely virtual during using this stuff. So, so uh, there's two components kind of augmenting the physical and studio class. One is the physical making, which we can't really augment with Mural, right? We're using our hands and creating things in the shop. Um, and then the second thing that Mural really helps with is this physical presence and these design dialogues that we have about the work that's being created. And that's where I really find value in Mural. Um, so, you know, like I said earlier, I'm using these two tools at the same time and, you know, Zoom, I think we're all pretty familiar with, we get to see everybody and we can, you know, talk live, but we, there's not really any uh, collaborative opportunity there. And so that's where Mural comes, comes in to the equation for me and that we can all basically have these two apps open simultaneously and we can see each other and hear each other through Zoom, but then we can also collaborate with, with each other through Mural Live and we can see everyone's actions. So that's kind of the context for how I use the app. Um, and the really like the, 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 there, there's three examples that I'm gonna show you today. 
And these are the kind of the, there's actually four ways that I use Mural, um, but I'm gonna show you um, uh, kind of a discussion example. Um, I'm gonna show you a, a directed critique kind of um, situation. And then I'm gonna show you kind of a peer-to-peer -peer breakout session. Um, and then after all that is done, I can still use the files that I created in Mural to go back outside of class. And I can use those and the student can also use those, which I think we've seen some great examples of prior to mine. So this is kind of the physical norm. You know, we're in a class, we're all looking at work together and, and commenting on stuff. And during that um, time, you know, usually what I'm doing in physical space is I'm using a whiteboard and writing stuff down and even students are writing stuff down. And it's pretty clear that Mural is like a direct translation for this in its most basic form. And so that's how I use it. Um, so the example here that I'm showing you now is uh, on the left is kind of um, a capture that I took of, of us literally discussing um, an assignment. And so you don't see everybody on screen here, but everyone is live in the class and I'm having a discussion with everybody and talking about all the post-its that everyone has posted up. So everyone has a posted color and they write, you know, whatever, what I'm asking for that day is um, some language. And so they wrote some language on a post-it and then we sit around and discuss it. And then I'm able to kind of be the facilitator and walk through the class and organize our thoughts and use Mural as a way to um, come to a, a live consensus. And um, hopefully it's kind of an equitable way to um, allow everyone to have a voice and see what it, I'm doing and, and, and how I'm you know, organizing all of the thoughts. So I'm gonna just switch over quickly to the actual board that I think that you guys have access to. Can you see that board? Yeah. So, um, yes. so this is the board that, um, that I just showed. Uh oh, what am I doing here? I'm getting lost. So this is the board here that I started work uh, working with in that video. Um, and then, you know, the question that we're discussing right now is um, what words could we use to define the qualities of utility? And so everyone came in that day, and um, you know, the assignment was to basically fill up these post-its with their language and. When we started out, you know, all of those post-its were organized in a very particular color that everyone had associated to their name. And throughout the discussion, what happened is that all of these post-its get moved around and um, organized. And then we come basically come down to the, the last set, which are in black, which we all decided that these were like the most key um, take key takeaways for everybody for the day. So this board is really about um, you know, using Mural in conjunction with Zoom as a way to have a discussion. And that's kind of the result of that. So then the, uh, the next one is um, a critique. And typically what I do in my class is um, when people post work up on the, in the front of the class, um, I use, sometimes I use post-its as a way to gather critique. And so Mural was like a really great way for me to, to handle that digitally. And I set up a board. Um, I think it's the second board in the facilitation chair. I don't know if you guys can see that yet. Um, but on the board, I have a schedule. And I'll show you the board after this. But I set up a schedule that sets up the, the day. And then also another great feature of Mural is that you can set a timer up on the, up on the top of the browser window. And so you can set that timer. And it, and it, and it really sets a very specific time for comment and critique and you can really structure your class and use that timer. I usually use my phone in, in, in class and so Mural has like this digital timer, which is great. And then I also have instructions for you know what we're gonna be doing. So on the right here, you're gonna see like a capture, video capture of the actual use case for this, which is I've created this grid, a feedback grid. And so you have someone in Zoom presenting their work with a screen share, kind of like what I'm doing right now. And then they have another window open, another browser window open, and they're using Mural as a place to put their comments and critique the work that's being shown on Zoom. And I've set up this grid as um, just a four-way grid. You could set it up as anything. It could be one square even, you know, just comments. 
Um, but I have up in here, works well, needs to change, unanswered questions and new ideas to try. And I ask people to put two post-its in each one of those quadrants for the people presenting work. And so what you can see down here on the right is um, you can actually see people entering all of their comments. And what's great about that is as an instructor, I can see who's participating and I can see who's not participating immediately. And I can also see what they're writing to each other. So I get a sense of like the language that they're using and, and kind of the concepts that they're understanding and the critique that they're giving. And then so I can use that post-it or these collection of post-its from people after class to have a discussion either with the person about their work or about their critique to other people. And so it's great. It's kind of a great record. And I used to, in my physical space, I used to have everyone post their post-its up on a, on, a, on a wall and I would take a picture with my iPhone. And this is just so much clearer because I have a, a record of it for myself. But then um, there's also a real value for the student, which is to go back to this board and they can see what everyone wrote. And because everyone's name is associated to the post-it that they, they posted, right? Because they have a color associated to it. They could go back to that peer and say, hey, I saw your comment on this. I don't quite understand that. Can you clarify for that for me? And so it's a way for them to go back and forth, um, which is great. Um, so yeah, so that's the other example. Um, and then I'll show you that board as well. And this is this is that board. So basically what I've done here, again, it's real, it's <laughs> compared to what I what we've just seen from the two other people, Jeanette and Helen Maria, this is like really basic. You know, at the top, um, I just have our day outlined. Um, let me zoom in here. I'm on my PC, so I'm my 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 cursor is um, my my tablet. I'm not used to the, the key commands. So at the top of the board, I have our day outlined. And you can see on the left here, it's like literally down to the minute. And I can use the timer up here at the top and I can set that up to the minute. And what's nice about this is if we run over, all I have to do is come over here and quickly change it. And that's what I've done here on this board. You can see like 507. That's because the last person has run over for two minutes. And I know that all these people are now gonna be two minutes over. And so I can just come in here and quickly like reset it. I, they have instructions on what to do at the top. And then the boards down here are kind of, you know, what people have filled in. And, you know, if I want to sit back, um, if I want to just kind of um, jockey out to like the full board, I can immediately see that, you know, like um, Erica on the pink post-its note, she, she really didn't hit my two post-it minimum. And so I can immediately have like an understanding of like how engaged someone is with the work because they haven't hit my request of trying to put in two post-its. So I, you can use it in, in, in lots of different ways, um, but this is a really simple structure that I really like to use in conjunction with um, Zoom and critiquing. So that's that. And then the last one I have is um, a peer-to-peer -peer example. And um, in this solution, um, what I typically do in class is I set them in groups. And this is really helpful if you have a large group of um, students. So if you have like, you know, I did my, my, my class last year, I was, it was super luxurious. I only had five students, so it was really easy to manage. This coming semester, it won't be so luxurious. I'll have 13 people to manage. And so my, my load doubles. And one way to handle that is to break out people into groups and peer-to-peer -peer groups and have critique. And that way you're basically doubling up the critique and sometimes quadrupling the, the, the critique in the same amount of time that you would normally do one group. And so what happens here is that I'm sending out people into breakout rooms in Zoom. So I'll send them out into like breakout rooms of three or four people, and then they'll have a kind of an intimate discussion. Then they'll come back to the class and I'll break them into a different group. And typically in a room, you just send them to the corner of the room and they do their thing. But in, in you know, in a digital, digital format, I'm using Zoom for that, all, but they all connect back to the same mural board. And so um, I use the mural board as a way to set up the groups. So at the, at the top of the board, I have everyone's group, like who's presenting and who's listening. And I have a time, you know, we're gonna meet for five minutes, come back. And then on the right, I have very specific questions for that particular project set up and I'll show you that board afterwards. 
And so this is the kind of scenario in a, in a live situation. So you, again, you have people in breakout rooms, one person is present, presenting their project or their work through Zoom. And at the same time, everyone is, you know, locked onto the mural board and they're all using the mural board at the same time, but they're all in different groups. And so I can kind of stand back out of all of these breakout rooms and I can see what's happening in all of them based on my the fact that I can see the mural board. And so I can see like what group is not really doing anything, even if I'm not in that room, because I can see the mural board and I can tell like that there's a healthy discussion happening based on my view of the mural board. So um, the peer to peer is a really, um, it's a completely different example. And, it, and I think that this year for me, it's, it's um, I think it'll be helpful because my class is to double the size now. So, um, so let me go to that board just really quickly to show you that. And um, again, this is like a really basic board. And all I did was make boxes and copy and paste and move things over. And um, in the top, you know, you can kind of see that the, the top of the board has all of our um, groups set up. Back out just a little bit more. So, um, oops. So this kind of sets up the day. These are our groups for the day. This is um, one session, two session, three session. And it tells who's presenting, who's listening and who's sitting out. And then um, these are the, the boxes that I've created for them. And I asked, I used Mural in this instance as a very specific question to ask. Whereas the last board that I showed you with the quadrant, it's kind of a free for all free form technique for critique. And this one I'm asking, almost like validation, whether the group is actually getting the meaning of their project, you know, what's the message, and then they can comment on specific concepts. So this is a kind of a very directed um, critique session for everybody. And then everyone has this block, you know, that they can fill out. And then at the end of the day, they can go back and look at it. I can go back with the student with a one-on-one -on -one and have a discussion about what was written about their work, and then they can review it. Um, yeah, so that's that. Um, so um, like in conclusion, these are kind of the benefits that I really see for the combination. Um, and there's really three actors in this, um, in this play, <laughs> if you will. There's the participant, the presenter, and the instructor. And for the participant, and specifically, I think this is the best part about it, is that because we have uh, a lot of ESL students it allows them more time to craft a critique and create, craft their language. And that's super helpful for these people because they're, they're actually translating, a lot of them are translating out of their na native language into English. Then they're figuring out how to write it in English. And that takes a lot of time. Um, but this um, method kind of allows them time to write something significant or um, clarify their message onto the post-it, as opposed to me saying, hey, Jin, what do you think in classroom? And then suddenly they're like, ah, uh, you know, no, it looks good, you know? So um, I think it really helps students in that way. Um, and plus you can also, for them, they can see how everyone is responding to everyone else's work and they learn from how other people are critiquing other work. For sure, they're not just looking at their notes. They're looking at what everyone else is writing to. You've seen some examples um, in the prior presenters about using links to other sites and images. And that's great too, um, it's clear. For the presenter, the nice thing about it is that there's equity and critique. And I think that's key, is that everyone gets a chance to put what they wanna say on the board. And when a lot of times in a critique in live, you know, you're so pressed for time and not everyone gets a chance to say what they wanna say. And so the board really allows for everyone to have a say in, in what they're thinking. And I think that that's fantastic. And of course it's all archived and you can follow up with people. Um, so for an instructor, we get to see like how engaged a student is. Um, we can follow up with that. Um, there's a record of everything. We can circle back with, with um, students about particular comments or about their work. Um, and then, you know, you're kind of confirming a Zoom engagement. And, you know, sometimes you get people that don't even have their camera on. You don't really know what's going on. And Zoom is not really like that. You're not really able to hide in a mural board. You, you're really able to see the interaction like live. And you can write specific questions. So, um, so yeah, that's my share. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I I really want to uh, say thank you to, to Matthew, Jeanette, and Helen Maria for sharing the ways in which they instructed this last year. Um, you know, it's been a dramatic year, and everybody's been having to to invent new ways to teach successfully. Um, you know, Mural is a piece of software that we're using, but really it's about what kind of pedagogy can you build using this particular product. Um, so it's, uh, you know, while it's good to learn the functions, it's also good to really think about what the, what the approaches are. And I think all three of you touched on different ways to, to interact with students that uh, is really uh, thought provoking. And even as we go back to, you know, either live in-person classes, hybrid classes, some people of course are still gonna be teaching online classes, to think about how you can use all of the resources that are available to you. Um, I do wanna say, so we've got eight minutes for Q&A. Um, so if you haven't been thinking about questions, think about some questions. You can put questions in chat or you can unmute yourself to, to go ahead and, and ask our presenters some questions. And then also to remind you that we do have some more sessions coming up at three o'clock. Um, so I'll plug those now so we can get straight into the Q&A. Um, at three o'clock, um, Eric, uh, Peta Place and Bobby Dietz will be sharing a session. Uh, Bobby talking about 20 minutes to set up your Moodle gradebook um, and Eric about doing successful uh, screen recordings um, for your sessions. Uh, Julie Kurgis will be doing a session on hybrid teaching pedagogy and I will be doing a session on designing uh, research assignments that are creative and interesting and, and hopefully compelling for your students. So, and I'll be using a mural board <laughs> to demonstrate that. So. Uh, if you can join any one of those sessions at three o'clock, I really encourage you to. I think there's gonna be a lot of great stuff presented and they should be recorded as well for those who can't catch them live. So um, with that all out of the way, um, if people have questions, um, if they have shown up in chat or if you want to uh, unmute and ask any of our presenters, um, go ahead. And Sasha, if you, it looks like you have already, but just to, to let people know to look in the chat and you can see the link to our facilitation board that it has links to the different boards that, uh, that Helen, Maria, Matthew, and Jeanette shared with us today. Okay, so um, looks like Kate has asked uh, whether ETS explored a mural and Zoom integration, and do we have access to that in the CCA techno system? Um, that's a, a great question. I didn't know that they could integrate. Uh, we, we ought to look into this. Um, so if it uh, involves setting it up, I don't think we have yet, um, but we can certainly look into that. Um, thanks for, for cluing us in, Kate. I know that you are a Power Mural user, um, so I appreciate that tip. Any other questions or, or comments? So it looks like uh, Matt's asked, Jeanette, um, did you feel that in laying out the full coursework, some people jumped ahead? Um, we were selective about, about what we shared with them. So for the most part, we would, um, oh, actually that's not true. Well, I, all, all of those uh, project briefs at the very top of the board basically had, I think something like one or two paragraph descriptions, like short descriptions of the projects. So I found it useful because they were in their third year by that point. So I think they could handle a bit of preview or like really benefit from a bit of preview. Um, but then um, we would kind of divulge more in that larger section down below. And if I, I can jump in real real quick and you'll see it I think briefly in the video um, of our, our um, essentials demo that Daniel and I did, but there are also ways um, that you can easily hide parts of your board um, by utilizing the outline. Um, so if you are concerned, maybe you're in year zero or one, um, uh, you know, like Matt showed, um, you know, there are ways that you can build out your entire board and then hide sections um, from the students. Yeah. So that's, that's good to know about, um, you know, Mural is one of those things where people can start kind of just by using the basic functions and then the more you use it, or if you go out and watch some instruction, uh, you can start picking up new ideas and new ways to, to hide things or just various other facilitation tools that are useful. And although Matthew, I would say you are a much more advanced user than you were giving yourself credit for. There's a lot of great stuff there. Um, Casey uh, is asking, um, whether it's been developed, is there a way to have a sound bite, um, you know, as a way of critiquing? So if somebody has some content on there, could, is there a way for somebody to click and just create 
uh, an audio recording of feedback. That's if there really, isn't, I've got a follow up. <laughs> yeah, so that's a really great, uh, great question. I think a really important piece of feedback for us. Um, uh, I would say that indirectly right now, um, you can definitely add sound, but not directly in Mural at this point. Um, you know, I think that that's something that um, I'm going to bring back to our product team. But the idea of, you know, if you have a separate app that you can easily record your voice, including on your phone, um, if you're using it, you can actually post um, files and images from your phone directly into the Mural board. Same thing from if you're using a desktop or laptop, um, any file you can literally just drag and drop into the board. Um, and you can actually, again, simultaneously, if you are presenting and then have your phone, you can make a quick note and then actually you should be able to save that directly into Mural um, if you can save that as a file onto your phone. So indirectly now, um, although not too complicated, um, but uh, feedback for potentially future um, is wonderful. So thank you for, for asking that, um, Casey. Yeah, that was basically going to be my follow up is you, you just do it with third party recording software and because you can load files or links. So if, if it's something that that you have hosted elsewhere, you can just link uh, to the audio. Um, do, does anybody have any other questions um, before we close out at 250? I have a question. <laughs> I One of the things I struggled with um, is that a lot of my deliverables were doing the work in Mural and or making a presentation, which I used VoiceThread for. And so it was hard for me to use the Moodle grading because there was no automatic connection between all the parts there. So I, I don't know if that's something to think about for the future, but it was, I didn't really use Moodle as a place to upload things. Um, so it made the grading piece much more separate and a wee bit more difficult. I would say, you know, that, that could be part of a longer conversation than we have time for, but a really basic way, um, if you wanted to do that, um, when, when students submit work in Moodle, they can submit a number of different things. They can submit a text box and content that they put in the text box. They can submit files. Um, so if it's something where you're having them do the deliverable work in Mural, but you want to have a gradable item in Moodle, you create an assignment in Moodle. You give them explicit instructions so that they know what they're doing. Um, and, but those instructions would be to the effect of, um, instead of attaching a file, which might be more typical when people are turning in an assignment, you give them the text comment option. And then the text comment option allows them to embed links. So your instructions could be explicit that, you know, in order to submit this work, they're submitting a comment in Moodle that has a link to their mural board. And now it's an assignment in Moodle. So you can just give it a, a point grade scale, put it in your grade book, all the other things that you, ways you would arrange an assignment in Moodle. They're submitting you, you have that link in your uh, inbox for grading. You click it, you look at it, you review it, you provide the feedback and the grade in Moodle. And now you've got your record in Moodle and you've got your product in Mural and they're actually linked and you're not having to keep track of things separately because it's gonna be there in that one place. And uh, you know we, as um, you know, as Mural are also really looking at long-term tighter integrations between Mural and LMS like Moodle. Um, you know, we hear you loud and clear, Helen Maria. Like we want to make that experience easier for you. Um, and so, at some point, when we're you know diving more deeply, um, we'll be talking to um, you know. Daniel and um, and other uh, instructors and professors um, at our various schools to get insight on what would actually be beneficial for you through an integration. Um, what would make the most sense? Where would you get you know most value? What would make your life mo more easier to be able to integrate directly? Um, so more of that coming in the near future. Okay. Um, it is 2.50, and I know people have other things to do. They have other sessions to get to. We want to give people a break if uh, they're going to attend a 3 o'clock session. So uh, we are going to go ahead and, and wrap things up here. I'm sure many of you still have questions or you won't have questions until you've really had a chance to think about how you want to use Mural. So feel free uh, if you have you know questions about using Mural, help desk at cca.edu. Those will get routed to us. Um, and then if you, uh, you want to follow up with any of our individual presenters here today, um, I'm sure they're they're open to the dialogue. And again, I want to thank Matthew, Helen, Maria, and Jeanette. I want to thank Sasha um, for all joining us today. And I want to thank all of you faculty for, for spending your time with us. 
uh, when I know you've got a lot going on and courses to plan for, but hopefully this gave you some good inspiration and ideas. Okay, thank you all. Bye.